1912, when Unionists signed the Ulster Covenant, they held church services to set the scene. At one of those services, the father of the poet Louis McNeese, Canon McNeese, reflected how the Roman Catholic community was disaffected, and he reminded those present that Presbyterians had once been in a similar situation in the 1790s and in 1798. And he was right. Presbyterians, although we can be a radical and difficult community, also became firm advocates for the Union in the decades after the 1798 rebellion. These people were the first Republicans in Ireland, and a different type of Republicanism. But they saw the value of the Union, and many of their descendants walk in orange ranks on the 12th, determined to uphold the Union in their generation. This is because the Presbyterian community, like the Orange Order itself, sees the Union as the bulwark for civil and religious liberty for all. It is perhaps not a perfect Union, but it is a Union worth perfecting. There will be these major anniversaries over the next few years in relation to the history of Ulster, of Northern Ireland and of Ireland and the British Isles generally. All of these give us an opportunity to explore what happened, what motivated people and what we can learn from it. It will be a time of re-evaluation. It can be a time of reconciliation. Unionists must reconcile themselves to some important issues. Firstly, that not all those who signed the Covenant in 1912 were afforded secured positions within the Union. The lost Unionist communities of the Irish Free State are testimony to that. People felt let down. People were subsequently intimidated, bullied, some murdered because of their Unionism. Their orange parades were attacked. Today, the only one place they can parade in the Irish Republic at peace is at an often windswept beach on the western shores of County Donegal. Scenic perhaps, but also symbolic. Yet today, the descendants of those people still feel culturally British. And we hope that their government and the Republic will afford opportunities to recognise their identity in the years ahead and explore that identity with them. We should also acknowledge the reasons why a nine-county Ulster was abandoned and the political realities that brought that about. And maybe we also owe those people an apology. Unionists must also consider the stewardship they provided within the United Kingdom. Lord Carson warned of the dangers of placing one community in control of the other, as he didn't feel it was the best solution for Ulster. Was he right? Was it inevitable that problems would arise? Or was it the only way that Ulster could have been safeguarded and secured? Was what was inherited handed down to us because London wanted to extricate itself from the problem? Maybe we weren't perfect in our governance and our stewardship. We're nothing if not an honest people and we need to be honest about these things. This re-evaluation must also include nationalists and republicans. In the midst of these anniversary periods we will have 1916, the year of two very different responses on the world stage. The tricolour which was unfurled at the GPO in Dublin had green, white and orange to symbolise those great traditions of Irish society. Yet republicanism has never, beyond cliches, been able to understand the desire and the wish of the Ulster Unionist people to remain part of the United Kingdom. Eamon de Valera, speaking in the United States in 1919, said that, quote, there are among the Irish minority a few who love their British citizenship and are loath to give it up. To those, we have made the fair proposition that it is but a short distance across the channel to the shores of England and they are at liberty to move over. And that the Irish Republic will see they are recompensed for any material holdings they leave behind. This was never a realistic proposition, and it was at best wishful thinking. Never in the course of Irish history have so many been misrepresented as a few. It's now surely time 
for nationalism and republicanism to accept that there is no likelihood in a present generation of a united Ireland and accordingly little real chance further down the line of people agreeing to alter the status quo. The watchtowers may have gone but the border remains. Republicans in Ulster should consider a unionist view that Dublin really does not want them any more than it wants any of us. Ulster was seen in the 17th century as a troublesome place and as far as London and Dublin are probably concerned it remains a place with troublesome people. Unionists in their evaluation must consider the future expression of identity. Nationalists have to consider the proposition that much of their cultural identity is recognised today in Northern Ireland. They may retain their political aspiration but for most the respect accorded their culture should be a guide to them that they can be accepted within the United Kingdom as a minority with a rich culture, identity and heritage. The political status quo will not change. There will be no United Ireland, not in the political sense. But a new covenant to respect each other's culture would be a good start to marking the centenary of the major anniversaries which we will witness in the next few years. In the modern United Kingdom, of course, our island has many people from the Commonwealth, from Europe and elsewhere. And they too are part of our identity and our culture. Newer arrivals will also assimilate into a wider sense of Britishness. Such processes can challenge the existing community. The challenge is how to ensure that those who want to be here and want to be British are assimilated. Irish nationalists of a certain genre look to the idea of the pure, unspoiled Irish race without recourse to the fact that Ireland, like Britain, has been the stopping point for waves of immigrants from elsewhere. The Ulster 20th century poet John Hewitt has a poem which sums this up in the Protestant plantation context, declaring that, once alien here, my fathers built their house, claimed, drained, and gave the land the shapes of use. There are many who follow such a course in modern times. We should be celebrating Britishness, and being British is about pluralism. This means that the Orange Order can, should and will witness for its heritage and faith, while appreciating and respecting that others can do likewise. This is the British way. That we can celebrate it owes much to our forefathers who were prepared to take their stand for the sake of the Union. This is our time. It's our time to reflect on our heritage. It's our time to build on their legacy. Our time. And we need to use it wisely. Thank you.